All right, uh, so we're going to start the closing keynote. Um, so I'm just going to start with a, a short story about um, actually uh, why I can't start our keynote. So um, back in 2015, before I started uh, my master's at BU, um, I was getting into machine learning. And I saw this video of um, an algorithm playing um, Mario online. And so I was like, wow, this is really cool. And they linked to the paper. And it was Kenneth's uh, neural evolution uh, through augmenting topologies paper. And um, I, I looked at it. And then it wasn't until really uh, the following spring when I was doing a machine learning course and I had to do a final project. I was like, oh, yeah, that, that Mario game. And it was like really cool. And it just kind of stuck on my mind. like. It was a lot more interesting than, th than a lot of the other things I was seeing in machine learning. Um, and like the, the approach, the ideas, um, like this idea that you know, it, it's like, uh, related to nature and evolution and all these inspirations. And I was like, oh, I, wanna, I wanna work on this. Um, and, and so uh, then uh, I started reading some of his other papers. Um, fast forward to um, 2017 when I started hanging out with the MIT machine intelligence community, which was the original uh, machine intelligence community actually. And um, the first paper discussion um, that uh, I presented for them was the neural evolution through augmenting topology. And the second one was um, the other paper, Compositional Pattern Producing Networks. Um, and so Kent's work, I think, is like amazing. It's uh, the way he thinks, the way he approaches problems is uh, far different from mainstream machine learning researchers. Um, and definitely, I think, um, a lot more exciting. Sorry. Like, <laughs> this starting early. <laughs> um, but. I was too excited. My energy <laughs> just started radiating. Um, and so, um, but I, I guess like uh, enough fanboying. Um, but uh, yeah, so we reached out to Kenneth uh, and said, hey, you know, we're really interested in, in um, having you as our keynote speaker. Um, you know, you've done a lot of amazing work. And I think that um, some of the stuff that, you know, you're interested in would align with uh, the theme of this conference, which is really to democratize machine intelligence and foster future uh, researchers and engineers in the field. Um, and so Kenneth is a Charles uh, 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 Milliken um, professor of computer science at the University of Central Florida and director there of the Evolutionary Complexity uh, Research Group, co-founder of Geometric Intelligence Inc., uh, which was acquired by Uber to create Uber uh, AI Labs, uh, where he is now also a senior engineering manager and sci uh, staff scientist. Uh, he received a uh, BSE from the University of Pennsylvania in 1997 and received a PhD in 2004 from the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, he is an inventor of the neural evolution of augmenting topologies, um, also known as NEAT, uh, HyperNEAT, and novelty search um, neural evolution algorithms for evolving complex artificial neural networks. Uh, his main research contributions are in neural evolution, um, evolving neural, ne uh, neural networks, uh, generative, generative and developmental systems, coevolution, machine learning for video games, uh, interactive evolution, and open-ended evolution. Uh, he has won Best Paper Awards for his work on NEAT, uh, NERO, N-E-R-O, uh, NEAT Drummer, um, FSMC, HyperNEAT, Novelty Search, uh, and Galactic Arms Race. Uh, his original 2002 paper in NEAT also received the t uh, 2017 ISAL Award for Outstanding Paper of the Decade uh, in 2002 uh, to, to, to 2012 um, for the International Society of Artificial and Life. Um, he is a co-author of the popular science book, uh, Why Greatness Cannot Be Explained, The Myth of the Objective, which, by the way, everyone should read. It's like life-changing and deeply philosophical and represents like a lot of uh, fundamental uh, things in the fabric of reality, so read that. Um, and, so, uh, and has spoken widely on its subject. Uh, it is my great honor to welcome Kenneth, uh, my favorite researcher, and our closing keynote speaker. Okay, thank you, Justin, and thanks for having me here. I'm really glad to be here. Um, this is a nice place to be because um, there's students here, and, and I think that that means that I'm actually speaking to people who can actually change the future. So I'm hoping with this talk, maybe I can affect some of what you may end up deciding that you're interested in doing in the future. Um, the uh, topic that uh, the organizer suggested was the democratization of AI, so I thought I would concentrate on that and give a, a maybe like a unique spin on that. Uh, so, this is how to really democratize AI. So, implying that I'm not quite thinking about it right yet. Um, Justin kind of just told you this. I thought, well, given that this is a student group, you might be interested in like how a career goes. This is just the, the kind of steps I went through. Um, 
which is, uh, oh, let me give you a laser pointer. Oops. Undergraduate at UPenn, then I got a PhD, uh, then I became a professor, so that's somewhat of a standard thing to do. Then, but then, while I was a professor, I co-founded this company, Geometric Intelligence, with some great colleagues, um, and that was eventually acquired by Uber, and that became Uber AI Labs. Um, and so at that point, I took a leave of absence when the acquisition happened. That's what this, this complicated diagram is trying to say. Um, and then uh, from there on, uh, have been uh, on leave of absence, basically building up what is Uber AI Labs. And um, it's a good opportunity just because there are students to mention that, you know, we have jobs. So um, there's not just DeepMind and FAIR and Google Brain. There's Uber AI Labs. <laughs> um, and you, you can also consider us. We do fundamental research in AI and machine learning. Okay, so that's just a little bit about me. Um, and I also want to give you a little more background just about my interest. This isn't going to be the main focus of the talk. I want to focus on democratizing AI. But just so you know a little bit about me. Um, I was originally interested in artificial intelligence. Um, that's how I got into my sub areas. Um, and I thought of it like this. I thought, well, okay, well, how do you build this thing? Because that's sort of like where intelligence actually currently is. Um, well, it's like a big problem because, you know, this is astronomically complex. It's got Actually, the human one has 100 trillion connections. Um, and that's just some rough way of saying that there's a lot of stuff in there. It's really complex to build this thing. Uh, so that's a big problem. Um, but we know one way that it can get built, um, which is basically the only way that it ever has been built, uh, which is through evolution. So this was just sort of my inspiration. So I saw that, look, this thing is encoded through DNA. And there are names for these fields. Like, they call the artificial brains, if you will, artificial neural networks. And they talk about artificial evolution as evolutionary computation. So those are fields. And so if you put those together, you have neuroevolution, which is the field where I focused a lot, not, not necessarily exclusively, but a lot um, uh, over my career. And, and so that's uh, where most of the algorithms that I've been involved in uh, are situated at the intersection of those two things. Because really, I was just interested in the production of complexity. So it wasn't so much that I was thinking of like, how do we solve a problem or, you know, optimization as a problem. I was thinking more in sort of like the, the grandiose terms of like, what kind of system is able to produce astronomical complexity on its own with no guidance? And the brain is just kind of symbolic of that problem. It's just, how did this happen? Um, and so there must be, it, since it happened in nature and is really unguided, I mean, it isn't set up to produce a brain. Um, the thought that I had is um, maybe we could learn something about, in general, algorithms that can actually do something like this. There must be some class of algorithms that do this kind of a thing, or at least have the potential to. Um, but the thing is that evolutionary algorithms have never come close to doing anything like this. Um, and so it kind of suggests there's something we don't understand. Like if it was just a matter of, okay, well you just, you know, read a textbook in your biology class and then implement it as an algorithm and wow, like the, all of nature will just pop out of your computer. That'd be great and it just doesn't work that way. Um, so there's a lot that we actually don't understand. The biology textbook is not telling us everything. In fact, nobody knows everything because nobody really knows how to explain how this happened from an AI perspective. Because in AI, the bar is actually implement it. You know, in biology, it might be explain it. That's a little bit different. But here, it's like we actually have to make it actually happen. And apparently, we don't know how. Um, so that's what's sort of been inspiring some of this work. Um, some of this you may have heard of. These are algorithms that I worked on with colleagues and introduced um, some of the more well-known ones, um, like NEAT, CPPNs, Novelty Search, HyperNEAT. Um, they use evolution as a search algorithm, but they also uh, search in the space of neural networks and kind of trying to evolve really increasingly complex uh, brain-like structures. Okay, that isn't really the topic of the talk, though. I just wanted to know you know a little bit where I'm coming from. What I really wanted to what I really want to talk about is democratizing AI and machine learning, since that's kind of the theme here. Um, and so here's how I wanted to start with talking about this democratization. I wanted to um, give you a little bit of the standard narrative. So let me now set the stage for this amazing future that stands before us, where we will democratize machine learning. Okay, someday you're going to be able to do this, and here's how it works. You're going to be able to start with data, but it's not just data, it's like big. Like this is, you see this? There's a lot of data here, but that's not really what I'm, I mean, like we're talking lots more than this, but it looks like this. It's like really complicated. But, so that'll be cool because you, we, can, we can start with a lot, a lot of big data like in these kind of tables. But the thing is you won't have to actually know about that because it'll be like in here. So it could be on like a really easy to use stick. You don't even have to look at all that data. Um, it's all stored on that one stick and so like you just have to carry that around 
And then what you can do is you can plug it into like this big AI brain. Like you don't even have to know like what this does, but it's like amazing. Look how complicated it is. Um, and it's going to do something amazing when you stick that thing in there. Um, and then uh, after that, like you don't even need to use Siri or anything like that. You, you can just press this button. Um, it's big and it's red. Um, and something really smart will happen if you press that button. Um, and, and so like you really don't have to know much, and, and, but this is all you really need to do. And then what will happen is like the future will just be told to you. Um, and so like this is, this is really, really democratization because if you think about it, like anybody could do this, right? Like this guy actually can do this. It's true that he has like a special skill with his tongue where he can like hold, balance a memory stick there, um, but he doesn't know anything about machine learning, like at all. Like he doesn't, he doesn't even know how to use TensorFlow. Um, <laughs> And, but, but the thing is, we gave him this, this paw print button, so it made, made him know what to do now. Um, and so basically, like, anybody will be able to do it. It's fully democratized, and, like, are, aren't you excited that this is, this is where we're going? Well, the problem is, like, that's just really boring. Um, that's, that's not a vision. Uh, there's nothing thought-provoking about that at all. Um, that's just an extrapolation of current trends. Um, and I just want to ask you, is that really all that we can do uh, with this idea. Um, is that our vision for like the democratization of AI? Like, shouldn't there be something more exciting that's possible um, if we're gonna be really democratizing AI? Um, so let's rethink this for a second. So how could it actually work? Well, what I think is really kind of intriguing to think about um, that I don't hear like spoken about that much is like when I think about the fact that machine learning is really fundamentally about very human pursuits. You know, like things like teaching, like those are things t people do who are not experts in machine learning. But we have very deep intuitions about teaching where you have ask questions like, what are the right incentives to get these learners, which are usually humans or students, uh, to get good at something? Um, or search, we also have very deep intuitions about search, and I mean by we, I mean just regular non-machine learning educated people. Uh, people who don't know anything about machine learning, they know a lot about search implicitly in the sense of what direction looks interesting. From where I stand right now, which direction might be interesting to go? Humans have very sharp instincts about that. Of course, they can be domain specific, like a musician is more tuned to where, we, where to go with music uh, than, than, than an engineer, but we all have some very sharp intuitions in this field where we're familiar. Um, and so, so uh, they have these intuitions without any need for a computer science background or machine learning. Um, and yet th these intuitions seem like the intuitions that should be relevant to machine learning, don't they? At some level of abstraction, this should matter. Like if I really have strong instincts about teaching, how come I can't be really good at getting my computer to learn something? Um, why can't we harness these intuitions from the people who possess them uh, strongly uh, in the right domains? And so what is, what is it that is impeding us from doing this? Like, why is this not happening right now? Um, the problem is that the issues that you need to address today in machine learning to be a good machine learning researcher are not the fundamental human issues of teaching and search in general. They're not the ones that other normal human beings think about uh, when they think about doing these things that they actually happen to be good at and have very strong intuitions uh, about how to do. What we have to think about in machine learning are really obscure and esoteric, like technical minutia, like this stuff, you know? It's like batch norm, convolution, replay buffer, epsilon greedy, you know, indirect encoding, like hypergradient, RMS prop versus Adam, like who the heck knows what any of this means? Like who's really good at teaching and search? Uh, nobody, uh, this is a bunch of obscure minutia. I mean, think about this. Like here's this teacher, she, she's a good teacher, she's teaching her class. And it just occurred to her, she just thought of this. The real problem here is I need to apply batch norm to the layers and the confidence in these kids' heads uh, and switch to Adam so I can get a better hypergradient for my teaching. Um, I mean, who thinks like this? Um, and so this is, this is, of course, this is ridiculous. This is not how people think. They think more something like this, maybe. Like, you know, the real problem here is I need to slow down on, on new content and provide more explicit incentives for success while ensuring that no one falls behind the fastest learners. Like, that's like a normal human kind of thinking about learning. But how come that doesn't, that doesn't apply at all, like when you're thinking like this, which is the way we have to think right now? Um, and so these are the intuitions that should help computers learn, too. Like, if I have intuitions about how my students are doing, or my students are artificial or not artificial, those intuitions should be feeding into uh, how, uh, how the actual computer can improve in its learning. 
Um, and we're just not at that level of abstraction yet. But that is where I think would be really interesting for the democratization of, of machine learning to go, um, is when we create the playing field where that's the level of abstraction where we can think when it turns into, if you're a good teacher, then you have good intuitions about how to lead the AI in the right direction. And it is possible to harness these kinds of latent talents like that people have um, and hide the technical minutia. Um, so what would happen if we did it routinely? And so w why do I say it is possible that we can do this? Uh, because um, I want to show you now a few hints and examples uh, from my own work of it actually happening. And my hope is that by showing you these examples, um, it will inspire you to think of the next generation of stuff like this. Um, when I did some of these works, I wasn't necessarily thinking about it in these terms, but in hindsight, they strongly represent what I'm talking about here, which is empowering people who don't know all of this technical minutia to do things that they otherwise wouldn't be able to do, but in ways better than we probably could do them with the technical minutia that we know about. Um, and so let me show you what I mean. So the first example is Nero. <clears throat> this is a, a video game um, that um, we originally conceived uh, for different reasons, I wasn't really necessarily thinking about democratization at the time. I was thinking, what I was thinking was, uh, look, there's this neuroevolution algorithm, um, neat, and I want to show it off, like how cool it is. So I was just thinking about that, and so like a game would be a really good kind of like platform for doing that, because like tons of people like games. So I was starting to think, what kind of game could you make where like you would be able to like really showcase how interesting the underlying learning is? So the thought was, well, it has to have learning in the game. Um, like you have to interact with learning so you can actually experience the algorithm, sort of like viscerally experience it. So this was, this was a game, this is really old, this is like 13 years old, but it was designed with that idea in, in, in mind when it, when it was first produced. Um, and so here's like the idea. Basically, you're in this, this is a training game. So you're in this, this, this game where the NPCs, and that means non-player characters for people who are not into games, the non-player characters, they're gonna improve in real time as the game is played um, but the player's job here is an interesting twist, is to train these AI agents or NPCs uh, for a particular goal and style of play that the player has in mind. So the player turns into the trainer. So in effect, it's basically what I'm talking about. Like the player has to do training. And sort of the interesting twist here is there are some games like this, but they tend to be scripted, like where the, you pretend to be teaching something. But like the progression is kind of scripted into the game. In this game, it's not scripted at all. It's really learning for real. So like as you become a better teacher, it's because you're actually gaining sort of implicit intuitions about these neural networks, which are controlling these agents and how they learn. Um, but we try to shield the player from having to understand anything about machine learning. So they're literally act, interacting at the, at the abstraction level of like a teacher with students. I don't know why that's happening. Um, so in this world, every, every unit will have a unique neural network and they'll be evolving in real time as the player interacts. And what you're trying to do, uh oh, seems like we don't have a great, do we have, we don't have a great interface here or something. Let's see if I can improve that. Yeah, it's probably the, the connection, okay. So what you're trying to do, like the game itself, is you're trying to train some, uh, some, some troops here, some like kind of a robot, robot army for a battle. And so you might think about it like this, like maybe, now this is what the player might do. The player might think, well, we need to first learn to attack something without getting killed, so let's, let's put like a simple turret here that can't move, and we'll learn to attack that. But once we do that, maybe we could have two turrets and we could learn to deal with that. And then once we do that, maybe we could give these guys wheels, so now we can learn to attack mobile t turrets. Maybe we could put walls and so we can learn to navigate around obstacles strategically and so forth. And a long time later, eventually, after we go through this curriculum, maybe then you'd be ready to take your, your team that you just trained, you're their teacher, and put them in a battle with a team from like a friend on the internet or something. Like this is literally how the game works. So you, eventually the point is you're gonna go into a real battle. Um, and uh, so at, at that point you'll find out how good was I really as a teacher. Um, and so you're, you're really trying to uh, anticipate you know, what your, your students are gonna need to know, so to speak. You're truly teaching them. And you can see that this is a curriculum and so it does, the game doesn't say you have to have a curriculum, but you know, people just implicitly understand that that's how you teach. You start simple, you know, you can't teach calculus in, in the first grade, so you start simple with something simple, and then you build up to more complexity. Um, and people can create these kind of situations and get to know the students and how they learn. 
So as an aside, like the thing inside of here is, is neat, um, and actually something called RT-neat, which is a real-time neat. So was, the idea was there's a real-time evolutionary algorithm, which, or neuroevolutionary algorithm, which will evolve these neural networks while it's being played. Um, and it's kind of surprising, actually, that that can happen. Like these neural networks learn so fast in an evolutionary setting that you can actually interact with them while they're learning. But that is the case, and neat actually evolves increasing complexity of neural networks. So they're getting more complex as they're interacting with you, as they're evolving in real time. But the good news here is the player doesn't need to know anything about that. From the player's perspective, it's just some students, um, and they're just learning. And so what's under the hood is just under the hood. And so eventually, after training, you'll go into a battle, and you get to see how things paid off. Battles, there's a battle scene going on there. Um, and you can play, like I said, against people, uh, people's teams on the internet. So the, the, one of the important things here was this interface. Like, this is, this is machine learning without the programming and the math. Right? So like, they basically have to give them the ability to like, set up an objective function or something like that, or a fitness function. Um, but we don't want to like, call it things like that or have them to think like that. So we just gave them like, this thing we called sliders. Like these sliders here, this, is, like, this says, how much do I want you to, follow or to, to hit the enemy? That's, that's basically what this thing means. Or how much, um, or to, uh, oh, sorry, how much do I want you to pursue the enemy? How much do I want you to hit the target? Um, and you can also put in penalties here. Like, this is a penalty set. Like, I don't like it if you guys uh, cl clump together too much. So it means spread out and don't clump together. Um, and the player it just sets these how they want. And then they set up a scenario in the world. And then they just sort of run it and see how things go. And the guys learn in real time. Um, these are things on the left you can, like, put on the ground. You know, like, I can put different types of enemies. And I can also put walls and so forth. Um, and so these things interact to create the scenario. But what's going on is basically the player is running a machine learning experiment but doesn't necessarily know it. Um, so we've shielded them from, from the, the technical level of abstraction. So let's take a look if, if this works, which is extremely risky always to actually try to run anything. Um, <clears throat> let's just take a look so you can get a sense of what this is like. This is an old thing. So this, I'm going into Nero here. Uh, let's see, do I have, oops, not that. I'm not hearing sound, that's okay. We don't really need sound for this one. So I'm gonna say I'm gonna train some soldiers, I'm gonna set, I can choose an arena. Um, I'll go into this sandbox, this is the most basic place I can go. Okay, so here's my arena, there's my, there's my controls. And I'm gonna put an enemy down um, so I can say add enemy. So there's the enemy. That's my great guy there. Um, he's ready to get killed. Um, and then um, I'm going to set up some, some uh, rewards that I care about. So this says approach enemy. So yeah, let's learn to approach the enemy. We're not going to know how to do anything at first, so let's learn that. And let's learn as a secondary priority hitting the target. So they're going to do target practice while they attack the enemy. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to launch a team and uh, what you're going to see is that they, uh, they just, at first, don't know anything because they're random neural networks. So this, this is what it looks like when your brain is scrambled. Um, briefly, it looks like that. But look, somebody is, just happens to be sort of doing something right. And this is going to filter into the, to the situation um, that you know, the, the underlying algorithm is going to start to uh, learn from the reward that's being accumulated by these guys over here. Uh, and get better. And actually, um, what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to get near my guy here um, so that I can do some stuff interactively. So I can take my guy and say I want to move him around. And, oops, let me do this. So I can now move him around. And so what's interesting here is this is actually, you know, real-time interactive teaching. Like, it's by virtue of doing this, I'm actually capturing who's actually good at doing this, right? Like following me around. It feels kind of like playing with ants or something. Um, but what's happening is they're converging on the ability to follow me and shoot me. Um, and I'm helping them by you know, providing feedback by moving myself around. Um, and as you can see, the team is getting a lot better at this uh, than they were like basically one minute ago. Um, so they, they learn quite fast. It's quite remarkable. I mean, this is actually evolution happening this is one of the few demos where you can watch evolution happening in real time. Because um, usually you think of it as something that happens over eons, but this is happening over minutes. Um, so, okay, th they're, they're, they're pretty good now. You can sort of look at the full situation here. Um, there, there's, there's what the world looks like now. Whoops, move my guy. 
So put them over there. Keep them over there. So now, you know, once I get good at something, then I, I'm thinking like a teacher. All right, they, they're pretty good at this, right? So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to make the world a little harder. Uh, like I can add an, uh, an obstacle in here. Um, there. And now this is, this is like a catastrophe, you know, from, from an evolutionary perspective. Uh, this is not the world they were evolved to live in. Oops, try to get that. Um, and so, you know, there's some readjustments going to have to happen here and some more learning. Um, and you can see that there's, there's a little bit of uh, trickling around the edge, and they're going to start converging on this now, and they're going to learn how to go around an obstacle to get to the enemy and shoot an enemy. And now you can kind of get the sense of how this goes. So I don't have time, obviously, to go as far as I can here, because what's interesting, of course, is you can go really far. Um, you can train some very sophisticated behaviors. Let's see if I can get this back to here. Like these kinds of situations, like they can fully solve things like this. They can they can create very complex strategies, um, and and this is being done by people who don't know anything about machine learning. Um, and so uh, I just wanted to mention for a second before I elaborate on the implications of that, just because because I know that there's students in the room. Uh, like something about how this was made, because it just maybe ins is some inspiration. Um, this was 20 people basically working together for a couple of years. Most of them were undergraduates, um, and they made this thing, and it had a lot of impact. Um, back then, Slashdot was the big thing, so like to get on Slashdot, that was the social media of the time, it, and it did get on there and got uh, over 100,000 downloads, won multiple awards, including in the game industry, it won an award. Uh, there was a lot of media coverage, like there was this like headlines like "Gaming Revolution as Players uh, Train Computers," um, and so you know people really uh, react viscerally to this kind of a thing. And um, I mentioned that you know not to show off, but just to inspire you that you know you, you can do something really significant still while you're a student, and a lot of people can take notice. Um, but back to the main point here, um, look at this. Uh, this is really where it gets interesting. Um, we had forums set up for this game. It's called Nero, and we had these forums set up, these Nero forums, and uh, people would come in and, 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 and comment and write things, but what they started to do was they started to write, as you can see here, uh, procedures um, for like how did they get some very complex thing to happen. And so what you see here, like this is effectively like an article in a journal, except not written in technical language. You know, if you really think about it, it's like how do you get this very complex behavior? Well, here's a citation. You know, like first start with like this is the Den Denek Jovax method here. It's just some other post. Um, and and so you know, starting with that now, this is some method this guy, some other person developed. Now once you've fully satisfied that. Uh, you need to do this. You need to go into the circle spawn and lo it looks something like this and then continue using that smiting technique and converge on an agent that stops at the corner openings and shoots, shoots the static. I mean, it's got all this terminology here. Um, and you can see even a diagram here. Like once you're ready, you can, you can put in this configuration and you can create this circle and you're going to get this kind of behavior to come out. And what it just really intrigues me, you know, and there's other examples of things like this. You see these like step-by-step -step guides. Um, you know, have your newly trained your agent spawn in a circle to an empty arena and then insert enemy in the middle and fully reward approaching and blah, 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 and goes on and on and on. And what's really intriguing about this to me is this could have been, this could have been a journal article. It wouldn't have been a great one. You know, there's not like a new algorithm here, but it's more of the kind of journal article like, how do you get like a machine learning algorithm to do something impressive? And there are articles like that. And if they knew the right language to couch this, that would have been fine. This is actually a method. They've gone through this thing, and they figured out how to get a very complex behavior out that I, you don't need, we don't know how to get otherwise. You know, like a lot of the things like that we got in Nero, you can't directly train for, because it was this, the curriculum that allowed them to get up to that level of complexity. Um, so you really have to come up with these methods, these very graded methods, like first you get it to do this, then this, then this, in order to get to the point where it has this really sophisticated behavior. Um, and these are like basically, you know, journal articles. Um, and yet they're being written by like high school students who don't know they're writing them. I mean, how intriguing is that, that we can get people to do that? Um, and that, I think, is a clue about the democratization that can come in the future. Let me give you an example of a different kind of democratization. This is more in the spirit of search. So I, 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 the metaphor I was using for that is teaching. Like, that's like they're teaching. They're, the, the human is taking the role of a teacher and using intuitions of how you teach something, like the development of a curriculum, like the incentives that you need. This is more the search intuition, which I think is also really strong in humans and useful to harness. And by search, I mean humans have a really strong sense of what's interesting. Like you present a number of options to a human, and they have instincts that are very strong, like let's try this one. And it's not because they know where it leads. It's because they know it creates potential, which is a different thing. That's hard. That's not the same as having an objective function. It's just you say, well, this could be the foundation of a whole new field. 
I don't know exactly what that will accomplish, but I have that instinct. And again, it's domain specific, like a musician will have a different uh, kind of concept than the mathematician. Oh, what happened? Well, we have sound, that's good news. <laughs> For the next one, there'll be a little sound later. Um, I thought I could quit that. So, um, so this is about the search intuition that humans have. And just wanna show you how cool it is, how strong it is, and how interesting it is if we could harness regular, I don't like the word regular, it's just people who haven't been educated in machine learning. They could be very smart people, um, but just people who aren't educated in machine learning, how we can harness their intuitions. Um, and so here's what we're gonna try. This is another experiment. This is called Pick Breeder. Um, a neural network, as we know today, can represent, uh, well, can represent artwork or, or any kind of content. Uh, in this case, we're gonna use a neural network to represent a piece of content that evolves. Um, so it's gonna be evolutionary, but the neural network will output a piece of content. Um, and it, it just, uh, uh, this is another kind of aside, but just historically, these came to be known as compositional pattern producing networks. So they're kind of like a variant of, of neural networks meant for producing uh, patterns in space. Uh, like this face, which is produced by one of these CPPNs. But the details of that don't really matter for the purpose of this. It's just basically a, a kind of a variant of a neural network will be producing these pictures. All right, so let's play a little game. This is called Pick Breeder. This is something we put online. This little game works like this. Basically, we'll have uh, 15 random neural networks uh, produce these 15 random blobs for you. And this is an, interview called, uh, sorry, an interface called Starting From Scratch. Um, and then what's gonna happen is that uh, the, uh, the user will just pick ones that are interesting. So this is about the intuition about what's interesting. Okay, so uh, this looks interesting to me because uh, it's like, I don't know, there's a kind of parallel line sort of, great. Then you could say breed and it has children. Okay, so this is next generation. There's the parent that I picked. There it's children. They're all slight variations. These are mutations, see random mutations. Uh, it's pretty clear this is interesting, relatively speaking. I mean, it's the most different looking, at least. Let's go with that. That becomes the parent, and then these are children, um, and so on and so forth. Okay, so this is just a funny little toy, right? Um, you can, like, keep going, and it seems like a little toy. Maybe I get some blobs that look nice or something like that. Um, so what's the point here? Well, it, it turns out that what you can do with this is amazing, just amazing. And I'm going to show you. I think it really is amazing. It amazed me. Uh, what could you find if you played this game for a little while? And, and I really mean a little while, because if you think about it, like, Humans playing a game like this iteratively is like the opposite of big data. You know, like these days we do like million, like thousands or millions of iterations, thousands or millions of data points, and thousands or millions of, of evaluations of data uh, or, or of candidate solutions. Here, like humans don't have that capacity. So you're talking dozens, maybe hundreds at the max. Um, and so you, if you play this game through, you know, several dozen iterations, maybe a couple hundred at most, where can you get in the space of what these things might produce? And the answer is this, which I think is just unbelievable. Um, these are things found in matters of dozens of iterations. Um, no special knowledge input in, in, you know, built into the system. It's not like they, it knows about anything in the real world. Um, we're finding these because, because people have, an, has, have a nose for the interesting. They understand the potential of stepping stones for getting to places. Whoops. And so, um, you know, look at what we have. Like we have, look at this skull. Uh, oops, uh, my highlighter is just going away. I mean, look at the skull here. Look at the detail on that skull. Look at this butterfly. Look at the colors on the butterfly. Look at Jupiter. Is there's the red spot on Jupiter? Uh, these are not made by artists. You know, there's a car. It's got two wheels. It's got a hood there. It's got it's got the top. Um, it's just remarkable that, that that people were able to find these like needles in the haystack. You know, I mean, this is the haystack you're in, right? This is just a bunch of random garbage, really, out there. This is 0.00001% of the search space, you know, is this stuff. Um, it, they find, I, this is literally a species, because these guys are literally very closely related. I mean, they're even like a family. These guys are actually related to each other. And this is somebody opened up this area of the search space, and once you get into that area of the search space, there's lots of stuff like this. which are very closely related mathematically to each other. I mean, you wouldn't necessarily know that, but they are. Um, I mean, look at the detail on these things. Just, to me, it's just remarkable, people finding all this stuff. I mean, look at like this apple here. It's, it's symmetric in the body, but there's an asymmetric stem on top of it. Um, look, at this, look at the handle on this picture. I mean, is this luck? Um, like, why would this just appear? Um, but it's not luck, because the point is, like, we keep consistently finding these things. And the point is that people can do this. People are amazingly, amazingly sharp in their instincts about what might lead to what. And it's not that they knew they were going to these places. 
You know, it's not that somebody said, oh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to get a picture, and therefore I'm going to choose this blob. It's not that. What people are good at is, I'm going to choose this blob because this blob looks interesting in its own right. Like, it's symmetric, or it has some geometric property, and this could lead to something interesting if I continue down this path. And people have these kinds of instincts, and that became a stepping stone that then branched to all kinds of stuff. So let me focus for a second on that concept of branching, because I didn't mention that. That's a very important part of how this happened. Um, so in this system called PicBreeder, um, any user can continue evolving or brooding from any other user's published image. And that, that turns out to be a very important uh, facet of the explanation for why all of this happened. Um, and so, for example, like if somebody evolved a face, like somebody evolved this face that you see here, um, then I could just find it on the website and say, I want to start from there and not from scratch. So basically, I'm, you know, I'm sh standing on the shoulders of my predecessors. And then I get an interface like this with children of the face and so forth. And so the result of this is that under the hood, like what's actually happening is we're getting large growing what biologists would call phylogenies. Like in this kind of diagram, you're seeing like each, each one of these lines here like is a branch where a single user branched from the image at the top um, to get to another one through like a session on their own of breeding. Um, and, and so uh, you end up getting a, a larger and larger phylogeny. This is a small subphylogeny, of course, of the whole system. Um, and that's what explains, you know, how did we cover so much space? It's because people are opening up branch points or stepping stones for each other, and then other people are coming in and building off those branch points. If you think about it, it's like a metaphor for invention in general, or the history of invention, or the history of art, or the history of music. It's basically, that's what's happening in a microcosm here. Um, and the point is, we harnessed people in such a way that they could do this inside of the framework of a search algorithm. Again, there's actually need under the hood. Like, need is doing the search operations, like the search operators. Um, but in a way where the people don't have to understand that at all. There's one sneaky thing in here, like, which is, uh, I didn't show, I didn't highlight things. Like, look at this little slider here, like small change versus big change. You know, it's kind of like, oh, there's the learning rate, you know, but you don't call it learning rate. But, but you know, we, we snuck in some variables that, that machine learning researchers would be familiar with, but mostly, like, they don't have a, have to have a clue about machine learning. But we're getting them to do things you couldn't do with machine learning, you know? Machine learning is not gonna find all this stuff. Which is, which is very simple things. You know, you could do millions of iterations to copy an image or something like this, but you will not find these kinds of, like, kind of needles in the haystack that exist in neural network space without this kind of a system. So one thing we thought of, just to give another example, is like after that we're thinking, okay, well, it's interesting you can, you can harness people to do this. People have such strong intuitions about search. Um, maybe they could do something actually like useful. Not, not that pictures aren't useful in some way, um, but let's try to do something practical because the machine learning, like, if you don't do something practical, like they don't want to publish your paper. Um, so, so like what we thought of is like we could do this, uh, we called it NAIEC, which is, means Novelty Assisted Interactive Evolutionary Computation. Basically that mouthful just means like pick breeder, but like a little more fancy and trying to do something useful. So this is like a pick breeder like system, but what you're looking at actually is the overhead of a robot controlled by a neural network that tried to navigate through a maze. Um, and basically the point is, if we show uh, several candidates attempts to get through the maze and then give a human an opportunity to choose the one they think is most promising, can the human play a useful role um, in guiding the search for the optimal controller? Um, so it's basically the human gets to play a role during the reinforcement learning. We also gave him some interesting buttons, like step here is what pick breeder used to do. That'll just cause like a, uh, a bunch of mutant children to appear. But we also gave them an optimize button, which means basically just run a more conventional kind of optimization on whatever you chose. Like I could click on one and then it'll try to optimize it through some uh, external algorithm just offline away from you. Um, and the novelty button would say, instead of optimizing, go out and find the most novel stuff you can find from that point that you chose. And then I'll bring those back to you. And then we just give them this interface and say, you just do whatever you want and try to get the robot to solve the maze. It's a neural network controlled robot. And what was really amazing was that um, the, the human plus this was better than every other algorithm. So in other words, like, the human plus this is better than just using optimization. Um, the human plus this is better than using uh, novelty search, which actually turns out to be also good at solving this kind of problem. Um, and so, like, the human plus this is better than all these, and not just in terms of number of evaluations. I mean, in machine learning, we usually talk in terms of how many things had to be evaluated in order to get to <laughs> optimum. But in this case, it was also in clock time, which if you think it was just unbelievable that like humans are so slow, right? Like they have to sit around thinking for like seconds or even minutes. 
um, huge wastes of time to have this human suddenly come in. Um, and yet, even with that, it was actually faster in clock time at solving the problem because the humans were just so tuned into those very subtle things that matter in terms of what are the clues that this robot has the potential to solve the problem, like clues like the way that it's going around this corner just doesn't look right to me. Like that is not gonna scale. Whereas this more subtle kind of a curve will scale. There's no way you could write that into an objective function because it's implicit knowledge you don't even know you have. Deep intuitions that we have, um, but that are extremely fine-grained and rich, um, but only come out when a human is involved. And so the point is, humans really can be uh, immersed into a search process and provide value, and this is another form of democratization in addition to humans acting as teachers. So here's another question. So just, just thinking a little more on this, just to riff on the idea, like what if, uh, what if instead of pictures, uh, we like made the content in, in, into a game again? I obviously like to put AI in games. That was one of the things I did a lot uh, in the past. Um, so let's make it make, represent like particle weapons and then maybe the weapons would evolve to make players happy. Um, so it's like, you know, there's all these games where you have to pick up weapons in the games, but they don't invent their own weapons. Like basically humans invented those weapons. Um, designers who are very proud of like their knowledge, actually I've talked to these designers because they saw this game later and, and they were very kind of hurt in a way that like oh, this game's inventing weapons and then they thought they were the experts on inventing weapons. Um, but here let's let the game invent all the weapons. It'll just be based on what people are doing. So, so what's interesting here, though, that's a little different from what I just showed you, is it will be that the choices that are being made by the humans are implicit in the sense that they don't even know they're involved in this kind of process. So like if you're playing pick breeder, you know that you're making these choices, you're making preference choices, you're telling it explicitly. In this, we make it even that implicit. So all we ask the humans to do is play the game. Like if you see a weapon you might like, and when you see weapons, you can actually, you see a little bit of an animation of what they might look like you can pick it up, and if you don't like it, you don't have to pick it up, you can shoot whatever you want, do whatever you want. We're not even telling you that, like, how this thing works, that this is some kind of interactive system uh, for, for, for evolving content. Just do what you want, and we'll just track what's going on and use it under the hood to evolve stuff, and so that ended up called Galactic Arms Race. And this is like this multiplayer online thing, so you could, you could play 32 players to a server, um, and the, each one of those is basically like an experiment an experiment in aggregating human input in order to evolve new content. Um, and so like the player, uh, it's just a classic like shooter game where you fly around your spaceship in space. I'll show you it in a second. Um, and we call this collaborative content evolution. And so the simple principle that was exploited here is that the most fired weapons are the ones who are considered the most fit. So in other words, we don't make judgments about how good the weapons are. Like the weapon, it, you know, is it more effective at killing the enemy? Because we don't even know if that even matters to people. Maybe people just like things that look good, like look pretty, um, and that's fine. Then that's where things will go in this world. Um, so effectively, pick breeder is happening, but it's happening under behind the scenes. But people are feeding into it with every button press they make uh, to fire a weapon. So once again, just because students are involved, I wanted to mention that um, it followed the same model as Nero because it, by this time I had realized this actually can work really well. Like students can do amazing things. Um, so mostly students worked on this. There were some volunteer artists and musicians. It took about 18 months to develop this. And lo and behold, after hundreds of thousands of weapons were evolved on a particular server by about 1,000 people, all of these things were invented that I'd never heard of before. Um, and these, are, uh, these, are, these names are kind of funny because like, obviously there aren't names for these things because they're invented by the computer. So they're just all like invent uh, named in hindsight. Like people started naming things. Um, so like, this is like a wall gun. And it's, it's kind of cool, like it'll, it'll create this particle spread that just stops here, um, and then it sort of creates a shield in front of you so that the enemy can't come through. Or I thought this was very unique. This is called a tunnel maker. Um, this would shoot a spray of particles on the left and the right that kind of create this kind of sheath around you so people can't attack you laterally. Um, and then there's all kinds, just endless weapons were, were invented like this. Um, and once again, what happened is like it, the same kind of sequence of events happen where it gets on Slashdot, gets, gets a bunch of awards, you can see me here getting interviewed on TV about this. This is a gaming channel. Um, and so again, like, not because I need to show off about something that happened like almost 10 years ago, but because I hope to inspire you to see that you can do this kind of a thing. Um, if, you, if you just put together a team of students, uh, you can do something like this, have a lot of impact, and it can be really fun. Um, and so let me just show you it for a second, like, so you can see some of the, like, the actual animations from this. Um, I have a little movie here. 
I have no idea if sound's going to play or not. Doesn't really matter. Oh, no sound. That's okay. We get the silent version, I guess. Um, so you're just going to see some animations of it, like what it looks like. Uh, here's just somebody flying around playing. You know, that's so this is one of these evolved weapons there. Um, Sometimes when, when, when the player like destroys one of those bases, like a new, a new weapon will appear. I don't know if we, we can see it here. Um, but that's how you get new weapons. Um, and then um, here's just a little, uh, slide, uh, a little collage or montage of weapons. So all invented by the computer, um, all based on what players are doing. Look at this heart-shaped thing. There's, the, there's a version of a wall gun. There's a, there's a version of a tunnel maker. And so, you know, we learned some things about people from this, like that it is indeed true that people like, um, like things that aren't necessarily efficient or good um, or effective. Like a lot of people would, would just choose things because they were like flamboyant and, and attracted people's attention. Um, and like, you know, there was a whole fad of lassos. Uh, we call them lassos. They look like cowboy lassos. You know, they like fly out and circle around the enemy, and it's actually not the best way to, to, to kill something because, you know, you just shoot straight and it's actually faster. Um, but they're just so fun, and, and also you can show off that you have one. Um, and the effect would be that the game would invent more, right? So like the game sees everybody shooting lasso guns, so now the game creates more lasso guns, but they're variants of the old lasso guns. So you get this whole trend going of like this lasso fad, and then the fad will die down over time and something else will replace it. Um, and so it's in some way it's interacting with like human sociology, you know, to create new fads and follow the trend lines of what people like. All of it though, without people having to know anything like about what's going on in terms of the search algorithm. So that led to we thinking, okay, one um, one thing leads to another. Like the screen turning off again. And so if you can breed like all these kinds of things, like pictures and and weapons, maybe we could evolve flowers. So let's get away from violence because there's too much of it going on here in my, in my history here. So, so let's do something pleasant here. It's like, let's just involve flowers on Facebook. So here, this was a Facebook game called Petals where you could just like have a balcony and, and have your friends visit you. Um, and, and you can share the seeds of your flowers and, and trade flowers around. And, or you can come in and be nice and you can help out your friend by watering their flowers. There's, there's somebody watering someone's balcony, being friendly. Um, and they would grow, and, and here's like a little shop where people are selling their flowers for different, different amounts um, to each other as seeds. Um, you could also buy other items, like you could buy some pots or things like that. Um, and so you could like pollinate a flower, like you, there's some interface here, you could choose to pollinate, and basically then you could have offspring from the flower. Um, and then you could plant the offspring, and now I've got a new flower. This is, this is, you can see the relationship, right? Like this is different, but it's geometrically related to this one. It's also CPPNs generating these flowers here too. Um, and there's a bee for cross-pollination. So you could, you could have this bee help to cross-pollinate if you wanted to cross. Um, and so, so there's just another example um, of this kind of thing going on, but, but where it's sort of implicit that the people don't necessarily think of this as a search algorithm. They're not interested in it at that level necessarily, um, but they're still contributing to this very large scale search through, in this case, like flower space. Okay, so. I showed you all of this because I wanted to kind of uh, justify my claim that implicit knowledge and intuition are very, very powerful. Like the implicit knowledge and intuition of us as human beings, not as machine learning researchers. But machine learning, you highlight the word machine, is all about technical knowledge today. Um, and actually, the reason I really wanted to go through all the examples there kind of give you a laundry list is because there are so few examples of this kind of a thing. You know, there's no, I just wanted you to see that there's a lot of ways of thinking about this because um, you don't get to see a lot of examples. Um, so machine learning is about technical knowledge, but, but our implicit knowledge is more about learning, you know, in the machine learning. Like there's machine and there's learning. Learning is something we do as humans and teaching is something we do to help people learn. And so unlocking implicit knowledge is a very interesting possibility from the standpoint of democratization. Um, I think Nero is different from the other ones I showed in the sense that Nero is very much about like incentives and curriculum, you know, in real time with interaction. It's like the kind of granularity of interaction you don't usually have in machine learning now. Like in machine learning, you just sort of say, throw it into the black box and press that red button and then there you go, come back later. 
In Nero, you can see it's very different, like you're literally interacting it with it in real time, seeing how things are going at a highly granular level um, while you're playing the game. And that allows you to be a very intimate teacher. Um, Pick Breeder, the NAIC, the GAR, the Pels, they're more about the potential for discovery. You know, the fact that human beings have a good instinct for which directions might be interesting, and that also can be harnessed. So I see those two things as kind of two different kinds of democratization, but obviously they're overlapping. They're not, they're not totally disjoint, and they probably should be unified with each other, ultimately, and maybe with other things that we implicitly understand and are good at. Um, but hopefully they can give you a seed of inspiration. So can machine learning make this kind of a shift? You know, what is the next generation of ideas to unlock implicit knowledge and intuition in this new generation of machine learning that we have today, which is much more powerful than most of the stuff I showed you? Like, think about what we can do now with deep neural networks, the power of things that we see today, like GANs, um, the power of what we call like deep neuroevolution now, which is new generation of neuroevolution, which is now operating at the scale of like massive amounts of computation. We have way more power, but we're not doing those kinds of things. Um, you know, those were esoteric projects which weren't even thought of in the context of democratization. But now that I see it in hindsight, they are. They are in the spirit of democratization. So what is the next generation that's going to unlock uh, all of that ability that we have inside of us? To me, that will be the day that machine learning really becomes amazing because we have these intuitions and they're not easy to use right now. Instead, we're thinking about, you know, uh, wh whether we should be using batch norm or not. I mean, it has nothing to do with anything interesting. Um, and so when can supervised learning benefit from teaching, like really teaching, like the way we think about teaching? And when can reinforcement learning, learning benefit from guidance, like the way we guide students through our intuitions about incentives and how to set up the problem in a curriculum such that they can get better and better? And when can unsupervised learning benefit from like open-mindedness? You know, like isn't that under the hood of what it means to be unsupervised? Like looking out into the world at all the possibilities, but being good at understanding which ones are the most interesting and then building off of those. When are we going to do stuff like that, which actually harnesses those capabilities, which we hold so strongly, implicitly inside of us? And who will create this next generation of algorithms, which will change the use of machine learning in the future? And that is really, the answer to that is basically why I was excited to come here. Um, you know, because I get to talk to here, like really the next generation of researchers in this area who are using these cutting edge technologies. And the answer obviously is you, because you guys are gonna be doing that. So I just had the opportunity to change the course of history in the last 50 minutes um, by telling you this and hopefully seeding your ideas. And hopefully you will do this, that's what I'm hoping, um, now that I've given you this thought. So, um, just in case you want to see a little more, there, there's some uh, links to things that I'm related to. Um, and um, it's worth mentioning, uh, Justin mentioned this book briefly at the introduction, but um, if you just want more thoughts, not necessarily along these lines, um, but that aren't necessarily technical, uh, this is a lot of thinking about some, of, some related ideas it's called Why Greatness Cannot Be Planned. Um, it relates a lot to novelty search, which I briefly mentioned, but has been a big part of what I've done in the past. Um, and that's another place you can, you can hear more or learn more. Um, and, and, I, and I do uh, feel uh, happy to take email um, or, or tweets if you want uh, also. Um, so, so feel free to talk to me if, if, if any of this uh, you found interesting. And once again, thank you very much. And I, I can take questions. Thank you. Um, hi there. Um, so your whole presentation was about democratizing AI, and one, I think, um, component that people think about a lot is how to make it more accessible to a lot of people, um, because, you know, it is something scary to get into. Um, and I think it's really interesting a lot of the ways you're bringing in these, like, intuition um, into the technology to make it better. Um, but what kind of things can we do to actually um, focus on the accessibility issue of democratizing AI? Yeah, so um, can you just elaborate a little on what you mean exactly by accessibility? I just want to make sure I'm answering your question the way you mean it. What is accessibility to you? I guess the accessibility to like use ML to solve certain problems, right? And at this point, you know, um, you have to have, mm. there's like an idea that you have to have a, like a graduate degree, you have to have a ton of compute resources, and it's not really mm. feasible to solve it to use ML for any casual situation, yeah. right? Yeah. And so this idea is you want to be able to use it, everyone to use it for 
greater good. Yeah, right, right. Okay, I see. A very good question. Um, one one direction for answering that question is is just to, to lean on what I just um, spoke about and say that um, you can you can maybe uh, the next generation of things that are like what I showed would be more generic. So like Nero was just like for this one game, which is not really useful for anything other than the game itself. But if we can create something like Nero, but it's generic, like it's basically not for a particular problem, but it creates an interface in a world uh, around something that is your problem, that then you get this kind of granular, intimate interaction with, um, but at a level of abstraction of like sliders and buttons or whatever people need, um, which is not at the level of like these, these hyperparameters that like you have to think about today, or, or let alone programming languages or stuff that's just completely inaccessible. Um, that's conceivable. I feel like that's a conceivable vision. Um, it's just like so at some point we have to abstract above the hyperparameters, um, which are not quite at that level now, it seems, because, because too many things break at the hyperparameter level um, that like uh, we would eventually need to call in the expert engineer like to, to just go back down to that level and fix it. Um, but I think that is basically what will lead to accessibility is once we really can extract ex abstract above that level. So you don't have to think at that level of abstraction at all. And that's some kind of futuristic interface. But it's definitely conceivable something like that could exist. I think it has to be much more, much more intimate and granular. Like, in, by intimate, I mean like you can see like everything that's going on somehow really easily. Like that's what made Nero so accessible was that every student, so to speak, that I'm teaching, I'm literally seeing their entire life and what they're doing. And I can intervene at any moment of time and change the course of like what's happening by manipulating the sliders or, or even moving the students around. There's all kinds of things you could do. Um, and, and so like that kind of granular interaction um, would be helpful to people like in order to intervene in processes that are ongoing and learning like in real time. Um, and then on top of that, like the, you know, the, the kind of interface basically to, to make this easy to understand and accessible and so it just anybody could just look at this and get like what am I actually conveying by actually asking for this reward structure. That's conceivable to me. I, see, I feel like we could do this um, and then cause all of us to lose our jobs. So we should try this. <laughs> is that an okay answer? Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> There's a question there. Okay. Oh. I think you might need to go to the mic. There's something back there. Uh, does the uh, learning process work in both directions? That is, can some output from a machine learning process uh, modify the human intuition? Mm. Um, so it, it definitely does work in both directions. Uh, so the answer is, is a definite, definitive yes. Uh, there's interesting questions about whether we should uh, actually intentionally try to magnify that direction. So like in PickBreeder, for example, it is happening like that already, but it's just that it's not, that the system is not designed to actually uh, exploit that direction of interaction. In other words, like by evolving pictures, I start understanding picture space as it's represented by neural networks. So like people who use PickBreeder a lot, and there are some, which was actually a funny thing that we learned, like, you know, there's a lot of people who don't enjoy doing something like this at all. There are some people who really enjoy it, and there are some people who enjoy it too much, you know, to the point that like they spend eight hours a day like evolving pictures. Um, and so it's like anything you create, there's always like one out of a thousand people that that's just the one thing they, they, that was made for them. Um, and those people who do it that much, they, they become like almost a, a model of a neural network in their own mind. Um, they don't think of it that way, of course, but but somehow implicitly they actually understand the space that's represented by the neural network in terms of pictures and become able to navigate it intentionally. Um, and this is like an amazing, a strange thing. Um, I even experienced a little bit of this, like, because I play PicReader a lot, um, that like I started to understand certain early things. Like I understood that if you get a circle, it, it, it's from a neural network perspective, it's easy to split it into two circles. Um, and sort of, and then it's easy to get concentric circles. And so this is like a, a path that can lead to faces. You know, you gotta go down that path to get to faces. And so I actually understand something about this space. Um, so I've learned from the algorithm back to me now about the structure of this search space. Um, and I can exploit that now because I understand that. So I can intentionally navigate towards certain areas. I mean, it's a very rough principle, but I have it at, a, at a, like an actual impl implicit intuitive level. Now I think that um, that's, just, that's just a kind of a, um, a happenstance um, side effect of the system 
but we could actually try to intentionally cause people to get this kind of exposure and then have it feed back in intentionally. Uh, and that's another angle that would be really interesting to consider. Um, that I have not uh, thought much about, but maybe now I can think about it. How big were the models for both the game and pick reader, and uh, were you training them on, a, on your laptop or a bigger machine? Or? Right, good question. Yeah, so um, the, the models, which were neural networks, um, were, uh, so they were, in both cases, they had NEAT, or neuroevolution of augmenting topologies under the hood. And that's an algorithm that, that is designed to grow from small to big over time, or small to bigger. So it's always growing size, um, assuming that it's helping to grow size. So, so there is no fixed size because um, it's getting more complex. But that being said, um, you're talking way, way smaller than modern deep networks um, because, uh, you know, it's like it, it adds one connection at a time every few generations. Um, so, you know, you, you're talking like maybe um, on the order of dozens of hidden nodes w after it's complexified for, for like maybe 100 generations or more. Um, so we're not talking about like, you know, hundreds, thousands, millions of connections like in a modern deep neural network, like far, far smaller. Um, which, which is interesting because, you know, that's true of the pictures and the neuros. Um, but it's interesting, you know, to see how much you can do with small stuff um, and how much. So, you know, I, I think you get some overcapacity in deep neural networks for some of their applications because, like, for example, with deep reinforcement learning, some of those big neural networks, certainly you could do the same with a much smaller uh, network, you know, from my experience seeing these small things. Um, but maybe more interesting than that is just, like, we can actually work at the, at the capacity of these large networks today. And certainly that capacity is powerful. So whatever you saw there, we could go way beyond, I mean, cons at least in principle, um, because we have so much power today. So that's interesting to think about. Might be easier to explain because it's smaller as well. To explain, you mean like in yeah. terms of explainability? Exactly, yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's true actually. Um, actually, we spent a lot of time uh, going into the, the pick breeder networks to actually understand how they draw the pictures they draw. And that is extremely educational. Um, actually, I don't know if, well, the site is becoming deprecated very sadly because um, it's using some old JavaScript stuff. Um, but if you can get it to run, like there's something there for, uh, you can go into the DNA, there's a DNA button. And you can pop up the neural network and you can see every single hidden node what it represents. Because these are 2D images, you can actually literally visualize any hidden node because it just will show you um, for every x, y position what that hidden node would draw and then draw a picture for it. And so I can literally see how it composes images from bottom to top. Um, and it's amazingly educational, just in terms of how neural networks work. Like I understood all these things right away that no textbook could have taught me. Um, so it's, there is some interpretability there. There's also, in Nero, there was a little bit of a click of people who would actually try to build Nero networks by hand, which is crazy. I mean, who, who designs neural networks by hand? But because it was a game, you know, like, some extreme group like thought, you know, actually one cool way to play the game is to just forget about the optimization and just create the, you know, the weights by hand. Um, and I was amazed people could do something. I mean, they, they, they can't get that sophisticated, but there were some decent behaviors created by hand. Um, and so people actually started to understand, like to think like a neural network. Um, so interpretability, and, and that's all, like you say, probably a lot of this because these are so small. Um, nowadays, we need, we need more sophisticated methods to interpret, and we have some for like visualizing the hidden nodes in deep neural networks, for example. Um, and so th those would come into play in some futuristic system like this. Um, we could see like every single node, like what kind, of, what kind of stimulus does it really prefer and stuff like that. That would be really extremely fascinating. I gotta say that if you get into DNA and pick breeder, it's just absolutely fascinating. Um, like to see like how does it build the skull? Like we found the mouth, you know, we found a single connection that controls the mouth aperture. So you literally, if you change the weight, the mouth opens and closes, just like a puppet. Um, who would think that this exists, you know, in this space? So you can learn a lot from looking at these underlying representations. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, yeah, um, so one of the things is that, um, like novelty search is like this amazing algorithm. Like I, I like love novelty search, like from the philosophical view um, to like the actual like way to optimize things. And so um, I take algorithms like quite literally, which I think a lot of computer scientists probably do. But for non-computer scientists, um, like if I were to say to them, you know, uh, they're asking for advice, like what should I do in terms of like my life goal? Should I go to you know PhD, whatever? Um, and they don't really know what they want to do in life. And if I were to say, you know, you should do you know novelty search, and it's kind of like this objective without this objective, and to convince people that pursuing this using this particular type of algorithm to find 
or I want this particular novel thing to find this thing that I don't really know what I really want mm -hmm. um, is kind of a weird thing to convince people of. Um, and mm -hmm. so I was just kind of like wondering on, on if you could like just kind of mention some of those particular aspects of like the more philosophical aspect of how algorithms literally like are like they literally are like kind of part foundationally in reality. Mm -hmm. They're not like these intangible things <laughs> that are either like yeah. right, they work in the computer, their simulations, mm -hmm. but they're these actual tangible things you can actually apply to your life. And how would you convince someone that like if you did want to, you know, you don't really know what you want to do in life, how do you apply novelty search to or how can I convince myself to apply novelty search to find this thing I'm, I don't know I'm looking for? Right, right. Okay, thank you. I, I like the question. Um, did I, can I get the screen back? Is that possible? Or is it me? Did I lose the screen? I don't know if it's my fault or... Okay. Because um, I was just going to point that, you know, you're basically, I can't resist to, to just note that this is, this is the book, basically, you're basically, basically summarizing the book. That's the purpose of the book is to answer that question. So that's just a note, but I should, I should also try to answer the question. Um, that what I, I learned something, so I don't know, novelty search, I'm curious, I guess I could ask, I, how many people here have heard of novelty search? So not, not everybody. Um, so that, that makes, I have to give a little context then because some people don't know. Um, so novelty search is, is one of the algorithms that, that I developed with colleagues over the years that um, it was, at the time it was radical, it was around 2008 to 2011 was introduced that novelty search only searches for novelties. It doesn't search for an objective, it just searches for an only novelty. And what was interesting was we found that this algorithm solves a lot of problems that you can't solve if you were actually trying to solve them. So that was a very, very interesting and profound discovery, in my opinion, um, that that was true. Um, and so, like, I, I started to speak about novelty search at conferences as an algorithm, you know, because it's, it, I was interested in algorithms. And people would started to ask me questions about their lives. You know, this is really weird, because this is like computer science conferences, right? Mm -hmm. But they're like, should I not pursue an objective, you know? because I want to make certain discoveries. So, so should I act like your algorithm? Um, and should we, as a, as a society or as an institution, like not be pursuing objectives? Or I spoke to a group of artists, and they said, oh, I, you know, I feel so much better now that I heard this, because now I understand why I'm doing what I'm doing. Like, every authority figure in my life uh, has been telling me, why are you doing this? Like, what is the point of making this crazy thing? just a piece of art, and some, some art's more obvious than others, but I met a guy who, like, he was, like, uh, using an ax to, to uh, whack a bunch of metal and then throwing it in the ocean so it would rust and putting it on the beach overnight. Um, and, and, and he's like, nobody knows why I'm doing this. <laughs> and he's, he's, this, has been an, this has been an issue for him, you know, psychologically. And, and he's like, you know, this, this is the first time I suddenly understand, like, why what I'm doing is important because it's a stepping stone that may lead somewhere and he doesn't have to justify where it goes. In order for it to be like a totally authentic, useful thing to do from the perspective of novelty search, which is an algorithm, which is a really weird thing to think, but it, it was like therapy sessions. Um, you know, meeting these students after the talk, because they, they gave me these long life stories about how hard it was to, to explain these things to people. And that was when it clicked for me that algorithms are about life. And that's why there was this book. You know, like before that, I hadn't really thought about it like that so strongly. Um, but it was through this experience of talking to people about their lives because of an algorithm that I invented, that I started to really realize that algorithms really connect back to life. Not all of them, I suppose, but, but they can as metaphors. In this case, strongly, because our lives are very objectively driven. You know, like our institutions basically judge us by objectives. They say, you're trying to get better grades so you can basically get an A in this course so that you can major in this thing and become an expert in this, so then you can build this thing which you told your boss you're gonna build and then if you don't, you're gonna be fired or you're, gonna get, you're not gonna get a raise or blah, blah, blah. It's all objective, all from the first day you start school. Um, and so this is suggesting like there's another way that things happen which is not that way, which is extremely important because we've shown algorithmically, empirically, that there are things you cannot discover if you're looking for them. You can only discover them if you're not looking for them. So that sounds like you know, some kind of Zen principle. But this is an empirical result. This is not like you know, new age philosophy. Um, so that's why I said uh, to Joel Lehman, who's my co-author here, like, we need to write a book on this. Um, because we need to explain to people that, that there is a huge implication overarching across society and in the lives of individuals in terms of um, how, we, uh, how we approach uh, discovery and innovation, and how we get to faraway ambitious places. 
Um, and so I, um, I think the answer to the question, you know, is that uh, especially in machine learning, because learning originally comes from humans and animals, um, it, is, it is just completely natural that, like, the met that the algorithms themselves are going to be metaphors for things that happen in the real world, in our world. Um, and that, you know, there's no reason to be shy about taking those metaphors backwards and seeing what they imply for us. Um, in fact, we can learn a lot about ourselves. We should, if AI is making any progress, that should be happening, shouldn't it? Shouldn't it? Because if AI, how could AI make progress if it doesn't have any implications for about ourselves? I mean, we're the original I, right? We're intelligent, so, so like, if we make progress in AI, it must have something to do with like, how our lives actually run. Otherwise, I think we're making very superficial progress. In fact, we should get profound insights out of it because we don't actually fully understand intelligence because if we did, we could build it. So as we make progress towards building it, we should learn things we didn't know about ourselves. That must be happening. Um, so, so in a strong sense, the answer to the, to the question is that um, that's absolutely like what AI is about in part. Um, and, and so um, I would encourage everybody to think about it in that direction, like what are we learning in the other direction about ourselves by, by doing these things, and what does it teach us about maybe different ways that we could run things, or, or our own lives, or, or our institutions. In the case of like what I was writing about there, like I was, I was really started to, I got a sense from the algorithm, which is very strange, like I never thought an algorithm would make me change my sort of views of society, but the algorithm started making me think like that the way all kinds of institutions are run is just totally wrong-headed. Um, you know, look at, look at the National Science Foundation, how it funds research. Like in the National Fi Science Foundation, like you get a panel of experts and they want to know, they want to know what are you trying to accomplish? And then they assess whether it's likely to succeed. I mean, it's entirely objective. And here we have evidence from AI that there are things that you cannot do in that paradigm. Like you have to actually not be trying to do them to, in order for them to happen. Um, so the entire organization of the, of the funding agency for the United States for how science gets funded is completely ignorant of this principle, which is empirically grounded in AI research. Um, so I get concerned, you know? I'm thinking, like, this is just, somebody needs to know about this, and that's why there's a book. Um, it's because I wanted to have some public discussion of this at a higher level. So I think it's a very unique thing. Like, I don't think there's a lot of, like, almost political books based on an algorithm. Um, I don't know, maybe there's none other than that. Um, but there was, so I'm just as surprised as anybody that anybody would write a book like that. Um, but I just felt compelled, like, we have to write this, because people should be thinking about this issue. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, and I really like the idea of making machine learning more accessible for the public. And I wonder what you think about the um, new frameworks such as AutoML or AutoKeras that um, automatically chooses a neural network and adjusts the hyperparameters for on the non-machine learning experts. Mm. Do you think that would uh, actually make maybe um, machine learning even more accessible and change everyone's life? So I, I think it's really cool. I mean, I, I'm, I'm definitely, you know, support that, that research and, and think it's important. But I think it's more of the variety of the first type that I showed in this talk, which, which I, I made fun of a little. But I don't really mean to put down AutoML, because I, I definitely think it's important. Um, but, you know, it's sort of like a mainstream obvious thing to try to do. You know, let's just automatically figure out all the hyperparameters. Let's automatically learn the neural network architectures. I mean, of course we want to do that. It's not, it's not that I'm against it. <laughs> I mean, I'm for it. We want to do that. But my, I just think it's just so obvious you don't need to have a talk for me to tell you that. Um, I'm trying to tell you that there are other, more, maybe more intriguing opportunities here that we might not be totally thinking about. Um, those are just more like, yeah, that's the standard narrative. You know, we're going to aut automate all of those things, and, and so you won't have to know as much, and that's nice. Totally agree with that. But let's drill even farther. Like, let's actually harness the fact that we are all machine learning researchers, in effect. Um, and we just don't know it. Um, and what could we go if we actually did that? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> so I had a nice question. Um, very nice talk. I, I really enjoyed it. So I'm kind of curious, um, in terms of... I guess optimizing for kind of objectives which are human determined, like I'm totally on board that um, doing it with humans works really well. I'm kind of curious, are there objectives, say, so I work someone on autonomous vehicles, some of the metrics which are there which kind of aren't judged to be, say, beautiful or useful by humans, but like a real honest to God metric which we're trying to optimize. Are there ways that we can leverage kind of human intelligence for that? 
And then possibly relatedly, I'm, I'm kind of curious, could you maybe say something about what you're working on in geometric intelligence or in Uber AI? Mm -hmm. So just to rephrase the question, yeah. um, a lot of these things seem great and they're very efficient when you have humans crafting something which is valuable according to human sort of metrics right, of right, right. beautifulness or uh -huh. with, with flowers or faces. Right, um, right. But I'm curious, are there other things that we can leverage human intelligence for, particularly kind of metrics that maybe are, say, physical or something right, right. else? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I, I kind of see two sides to that. Like one side is um, we can, uh, like I showed in that briefly, that thing I called NAIEC, where I showed like an interface for actually looking at solutions to problems as opposed to just art or aesthetic stuff. Um, we can create interfaces that allow people to look at things aesthetically, which are ultimately practical. So we can do that and, and, and thereby harness some implicit intuitions that way. But I think your question kind of goes towards also the question of can the framing of the objective itself uh, draw from these kinds of intuitions or like maybe we can even write down objectives more um, more informally in some way that like takes advantage of like these kinds of um, aesthetic or elegance types of sensitivities that we might have. Um, and uh, because of the fact that like, you know, those, sometimes, you know, people think of it as like external objectives or extraneous objectives or, or like these, these companion objectives which aren't the actual objective of like say it's a reinforcement learner, but that like come along for the ride because just by virtue of doing that at the same time, like you're probably gonna be get better at your primary task. Um, and, and those, like the primary task is, is fairly, usually kind of formal because like, you know exactly what you want. Like you want. You want the neural network to solve this problem or something, so we know that. But then these like companion objectives, it's like anything is game for that, you know? And so that, that could be sort of like based on elegance or, 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 or something aesthetic or, or, or just intuition. Um, and, and there I think there is room for um, like non-AI researchers, yes, to, to potentially frame things. Um, in unconventional ways that, that by virtue of being unconventional then um, actually enhance the behavior of the, of the, of the overall learning process. Um, whether uh, that should be done by writing it down or, or through some interface that kind of hides the need to write it down, I'm not totally sure. Because I, I think the way I'm thinking about this is writing down the objective functions. Um, like that is still hard, I mean, for, for like someone who's not used to writing a kind of objective function. Um, and so that would exclude some people. So maybe there's some even more kind of interface level thing that you don't even feel like you're writing it down, but you're just kind of describing like what kind of behaviors you want to see. Um, and then they come along for the ride and then they kind of like enhance the ultimate optimization objective. And I, I think that's totally conceivable. Yeah, I could see that. Um, and um, it, it's another good direction to go. Um, you know, people have been, have recently looked at like an open AI, they did something on like evol evolving the, um, the reward function for reinforcement learning. And so you start to see things a little in the spirit of like the, the way that we describe our rewards themselves is open to some debate and interpretation. So um, certainly bringing humans into that makes sense. Um, I hope that kind of gets towards the, the, the question, the first part of the question. Uh, the second part of the question is like, what is going on in geometric intelligence or Uber AI labs? So <laughs> geometric intelligence um, is, is no longer exists. So nothing's going on there, but because it became Uber AI labs, so it basically just, Uber AI Labs is the extension of that. Um, and so what is going on there? Um, it's worth saying what's going on there a little bit because, because some people here might be interested to actually join. Um, so I just want to make, make, a, make a kind of a clear, uh, clear explanation of what it is. Um, Uber AI Labs um, was created from geometric intelligence uh, with the purpose of advancing fundamental research inside the company of Uber. Um, and so Uber recognized that it is important to have fundamental machine learning research as part of its repertoire. I mean, obviously it's, it should be a small part. <laughs> you don't have the whole company doing that. Um, but some part of the company needs to have an eye on the cutting edge. And there's all kinds of good reasons for that um, that are similar to many other technology companies and why they're doing it, you know. I mean, lots of these companies, like Google has Google Brain and Facebook has Face, uh, FAIR or Facebook AI research and so forth, um, see a value in fundamental machine learning research. And, and Uber, uh, also has a value, I mean, for slightly different reasons, because um, it's a different business. But like, if you really think about Uber, Uber's business is basically machine learning throughout, like every process going on at Uber is subject to optimization at the level of machine learning. There's a massive amount of data. 
every ride ever taken by anybody across the world, you know, there's unbelievable amounts of rides being taken that Uber is actually uh, the, responsible for. Um, and all of the food deliveries taking place, the food recommendations taking place, the customer service interactions, which there are just unbelievable numbers of these. So we're dealing with things like natural language because there's not enough people you could hire in the world to deal with all the questions people might have. And so, and of course, self-driving is there in, in Uber ATG. So Uber, the company, is about machine learning. So it's clear that Uber needs to be at the forefront of machine learning. And therefore, there is Uber AI Labs, and Uber AI Labs uh, is, the, is the fundamental research arm of the company. Um, and it's sort of divided into uh, what we call connections, which are people who try to connect advances in AI uh, to the business, and then what we call core, which is people who are uh, just trying to advance the state of the art in machine learning. Um, and so I'm being really specific about this because I, I want you to, to understand that this is actually true, um, that like there is really fundamental research now going on um, Uber AI's uh, core is now uh, about 35 people and expanding. Um, so Uber is really investing in this seriously and, and really cares about being at the forefront and recognizes that across the company we need experts in, in machine learning and data science and, and so we have to be a leader in that in order to attract those people. Um, and so there will be publishing, there is already, you know, see, you'll see Uber at, at the top conferences already for the last couple of years. Um, and there will be you know, public talks and source code releases and open sourcing and the things that you've come to expect from the big industrial labs also. So basically we're doing all kinds of things, um, all kinds of uh, artificial intelligence uh, research uh, at the fundamental level and at the, at the application level, both to incrementally advance algorithms, to improve safety and interpretability, and to fundamentally advance the field like in the long-term view, like getting towards the super whatever powerful AI that you know, whatever you want to call that. Um, and so that is going on there. So like specific projects and things like that, um, it just, you know, it covers the gamut. We have some IP that's like, you know, proprietary from before, from geometric intelligence. Um, but in generally, we just cover the gamut of research now. I mean, we're becoming like a pretty large organization. Um, so we're doing all kinds of things. And so, uh, you know, we, um, we, we really believe in the diversity of ideas, um, and so, uh, we don't want to just follow any particular fad. And as you can imagine, my way of thinking has some influence, like, you know, like the fact that I don't like to converge towards some particular objective view of how, where we should be going. So that has some influence on it, so maybe provide some uniqueness to the environment. Um, and it certainly applies to a research institution, like those kinds of thinking. Um, and so, you know, I invite you to consider it, because um, you guys are some of the leaders. Um, and or email me if you're interested to hear more. Okay. Uh, if you had, say, a, a blank check and a, a team, and maybe you do, uh, what kind of stuff would you be uh, working on? <laughs> In terms um, of, uh, would it be follow-ups from some of the things you presented? Uh, just some about me. Um, so uh, would I, um, well, I'm interested in several things, so it wouldn't be one thing, but I guess the thing I've most recently been going around talking about the most is what's called open-endedness. Um, and that is, uh, how can we write an algorithm that can produce interesting stuff forever, um, automatically? Um, so it's a little different from, I think a lot of machine learning is about convergence, basically like getting to an optimum. Um, and I think that's, that's, that's obviously extremely critical and you know, worth trillions of dollars to the world. Um, but I'm just really interested in open-endedness just sort of because of my personality and like where, I, where I've come from, in, inspired by evolution, because I see that in the natural world, um, there's this algorithm there, evolution, that produced all of living nature. Just an incredibly creative algorithm, and that's one run. It's nothing like a machine learning algorithm. Like, you'd need to run it a, a, a machine, if we had a great machine learning algorithm that had the capacity to produce things like that, there would be a billion separate runs that you'd need to get all that stuff. This is one run of a single algorithm, which wasn't even created for this purpose or any purpose. Um, and what's interesting and intriguing to me is that we don't, we don't have a clue how to write an algorithm like that that just generates cool stuff, like forever. And it shouldn't stop. And it should be increasingly complex, because that's what we see in nature, is that complexity increases uh, over time in many lineages. So you've got increasingly complex, increasingly diverse, consistently interesting, which I agree is subjective, but still, we should be build things that interest us, because it's for us. We're the humans who are the consumers. Um, and so the fact there's a proof of concept in nature that you can do something like this for a billion years, it's just incredible and inspiring to me. I mean, 
Most of our algorithms are done within a week. You're lucky if it's still going after a week and doing anything interesting. It's either converged or it's stuck. This is something that's been going for more than a billion years. It's still producing cool stuff today. Um, and it will go on uh, and continue to do that unless a catastrophe happens. Um, and so it's interesting that we don't know how to build something like that. Um, w this could be used for design. Um, it's not just to produce, I don't want to just necessarily reproduce Earth in all its glory. That's not the point. Um, the point is like, imagine if I could just generate every possible robot morphology and walking, walking gait all at once in a single run of an algorithm that you could ever want to see. Um, just design everything for me all at once. Um, design every genre of music in one run. Just come up with it. The longer I run, the more genres I get. Um, just think about what you could do with algorithms like this. Um, it would just be just fascinating to watch um, and also very useful. Um, and uh, we sometimes call them like repertoire collecting algorithms. You know, they're not trying to solve something, they're collecting repertoires of capabilities that eventually you could use for all kinds of things. And so open-endedness is the thing I'd sort of give as the, as the front and center answer for me and just my personal interest. But I'm also interested in like meta-learning, I think is super important. I've heard at this conference people talk about it a bit. Um, meta-learning is like learning how to learn so that the algorithms emerge um, instead of us having to program the algorithms because I think that's going to be necessary. Um, and um, well, I could stop there. So that, that's plenty to, to chew on there. <laughs> Thanks. All right, uh, hi, I'm Dan. Uh, I'm the community outreach organizer and the workshop coordinator for Machine Intelligence Conference 2018. Uh, I wanna thank everyone for coming out. I especially want to lend great gratitude to all of our sponsors for helping make this event possible. Um, all of these student speakers who presented their amazing research across a whole wide variety of topics in machine intelligence. Uh, in addition to the panelists who were able to help share their experiences and their experiences in the machine intelligence community uh, more largely. And I also want to thank all of the attendees as well for coming out because ultimately it's not just a question of, you know, the experts that we have here. It's a question of bringing together minds and sharing ideas about what machine intelligence community even means. Um, and that means something personal to each and every one of us. Uh, and one thing that I think Kenneth was really you know, uh, good about highlighting was the fact that, you know, it doesn't matter if, you know, you have years of experience as being a PhD researcher, uh, you know, whether you are in one of these big industrial, uh, like, research companies. The fact of the matter is, is each and every one of us, uh, you know, we have intuitions and uh, sort of implicit knowledge about these things and ideas about where things can or should go, and it's important for us to be able to share that. Um, so, Basically, I want to be able to close out uh, this conference by just encouraging everyone here to continue to uh, want to learn and continue to want to explore and to encourage us to do that together uh, so that we can ultimately build a bigger and better machine intelligence community. So with that, I thank everyone for coming out. And uh, yeah, I hope everyone has a good rest of your night.